church. Good to see you guys this morning. My name is Matt. I'm delighted to be with you guys this morning. I serve as the West Campus pastor for a church out in Fort Worth called Christ Chapel Bible Church. If you'll please go ahead and open your Bibles, we are going to be looking at John chapters 10, 11, and 12 today. So please open your Bibles. You're going to need them, and we'll dig in there in just a moment. Uh, Just a quick word on why I'm even up here, uh, because you guys don't know me. I don't know you. I had the privilege of leading uh, your church's Israel trip this past February. Had a delightful time. Really enjoyed getting to know several of you, and really, honestly, if you haven't been to Israel, I highly encourage you to go because it's a great trip, and I'm really glad to learn about your fellowship and and get to feel a little bit more a part of this family this morning to see some some familiar faces when I walked in the door. It was a real treat. Just a bit about me. Um, I'm married to my wife, Darcy. We've been married for about 20 years now, and we've got three kids, um, a 14-year-old, an 11-year-old, and an 8-year-old. So our hands are full, and we're in the car all the time. Um, But that's enough about me and those things aside, I think the real issue at hand here this morning, the real question that's really kind of in the room is, who is this guy? Am I going to listen to you or not? Right? Research tells me I've got anywhere from 8 to 30 seconds to convince you that I'm worth listening to for the next 30 minutes. Right? That's why when you're, you know, surfing on social media or you're listening to a politician or when you see a commercial on TV, they always start with an interesting story or a funny joke or some sort of inspirational thought because they want to capture your attention to make sure that you're going to pay attention to what they have to say. But regardless of whatever technique any speaker uses, whether that's on your phone or on a television or even here at church, you still have to decide whether or not you're going to give that person your attention whether or not you're going to give that person access to you, to your thoughts, to your feelings, to your choices. Years ago, I used to run a discipleship program uh, for college students. And one of the things that we would do is we would take them to a conference out in Atlanta where they could hear uh, some really famous Christian speakers. And in the evenings after the conference was over, I would, we would kind of debrief the day and I would ask them the question, who got access to you today? Not just who did you like or who did you agree with or disagree with, but like who was able to plant their thoughts, their ideas, and their teachings into the core of who you are. And so we'd go round and round and there would be this great debate among about 30 students of like who was the literal best and who was trash, you know? It's so comforting to know how a speaker is talked about after he delivers his talk. So I hope you guys have a good lunch today. Hopefully I'm not trash. I'd let that go on for a few minutes, but then I'd get them really to the question I really wanted to ask them. And the question was this, for those of you who had a speaker who did get access to you, how? How did he get access to you? And that question, of course, they found much more difficult to answer because generally they weren't paying attention. And it made for a great discussion about who we listened to and why. Now, of course, this doesn't just happen at conferences, and it doesn't just happen with college students. It happens to all of us, all the time, everywhere we go, every single day. People are speaking to us with authority about how we ought to live our lives. I mean, somebody's trying to tell you, you need to buy this product, because if you don't buy this product, you're going to miss out on this. And if you miss out on this, then you might fail at that. And if you fail at that, then your image is not going to be what it should be. And if your image isn't what it should be, then you're not going to be liked. And if you're not liked, you're not going to know what to do. And you're going to listen to random politicians who tell you to vote for. And if you vote for them, you're weird. And if you don't do any of those things, you're going to get in bad health. And if you're in bad health, you should eat this. And if you don't eat this, you're going to die. I mean... That's what we listen to all day, every day, is people from every different avenue of our lives speaking to us and telling us this is how life should be lived. So the question we really need to wrestle with this morning is, who should we listen to? I mean, who gets access to us? 
Who gets to plant their thoughts and ideas right into the core of who we are and, and why should they? What I'd like for us to see this morning and I think what will be clear to us and in John's gospel especially is that Jesus is the authority on how life should be lived. Jesus is the authority on how life should be lived. And when we believe in Jesus, we get to enjoy life the way he designed it to be. Now, over the past three weeks, we've been looking at John's gospel and seeing how everything goes through Jesus and points to him. And you're doing that as a church because we want to make room for Jesus to captivate our hearts as we continue to abide in him. And each week, as we started our series, we're looking at the thesis of John's gospel, the main reason he writes what he writes, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, and here's where I'm going to key on today, you may have life in his name, that you may have life in his name. Jesus has something to say about life and how it should be lived, too. And what's interesting to me is that he speaks this message. John is saying this message to people who are already physically alive. So if you believe in Jesus, you are going to have life, but I'm already living. What are you talking about? There's something about believing in Jesus that makes it possible for us to live a different sort of life than the one that we're currently living. So we're going to talk a lot about life today because Jesus speaks with authority on how life should be lived. So if you remember last week, Garrett left off talking about the healing of the blind man in John chapter nine. That was a massively significant miracle that Jesus performed because that miracle and what the Old Testament says about the healing of blind people, it it basically says that only the Messiah will be able to heal the blind. And no one has performed a miracle of healing people of blindness until Jesus does here. Nevertheless, the Pharisees and the chief priests and other religious leaders weren't impressed by what Jesus did. In fact, they called Jesus insane. They said that he has a demon, and then they kicked the guy out that he healed. They kicked him out of his own synagogue. I mean, what kind of leadership is that? But right here at the end of chapter 9 and the beginning of our text here in chapter 10, we have this tension. Who is the authority about life? Who should we listen to here? Should we listen to these religious authorities who have been telling us everything that we've ever known about God and about how to live life with him for the past several decades? Or do we listen to this random guy from Galilee who has been doing miracles that only the, that the Old Testament says that only Messiah will be able to do? Who should we listen to? That's the tension where we pick up this week and where we'll start here in John chapter 10. So if you've turned there, let's start here in verse seven. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves, robbers. The sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now the Pharisees and religious leaders of Jesus' day had been really poor shepherds of the flock of the nation of Israel. And the story of how they treat the blind man I think is case in point. Their teaching and leadership of God's people did not lead to their flourishing. In fact, it's led them into legalism, hypocrisy, rejection of God's Messiah. I mean, listen to how Jesus speaks about these Pharisees and and religious leaders in Matthew's gospel. He says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all kinds of uncleanness. So you outwardly appear righteous to others, but within, you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus' ministry is going to stand in stark contrast to the religious leaders 
of his day. And what John wants to do is organize his gospel in a way that show us two compelling reasons why we should listen to Jesus as the authority on life over and above anyone else. And the first reason he gives us is that Jesus gives us access to abundant life. Jesus gives us access to abundant life. I want you to consider all of the miracles that John has highlighted here in the first half of his gospel. He highlights six miracles leading up to the one we're going to talk about today. In John chapter 2, he turns water into wine. In John 4, he heals an official's son from 20 miles away. In John 5, he makes a man who was paralyzed to be able to walk again. In John 6, he feeds thousands of hungry people with just a few fish and a little bit of bread before walking on water to save disciples from a windstorm. And in John 9, he heals a man that has been blind his entire life. The Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders ever do anything like that? How many healings had they performed? Zero. Jesus is always authenticating his word with his works. He's always proving with what he does the things that he says. And he's not doing it to show off. He's not doing it to use miracles to, to make more money or gain more fame or get more powerful. Jesus' ministry is a portfolio of his desire for people to have life, to have life to the fullest. And when they encounter Jesus, when they believe in Jesus, that is exactly what happens. You see, Jesus leads us towards what we need to flourish. Jesus is always leading us towards what we need to flourish. Like I said before, my wife and I have been married 20 years, and we have this thing in our marriage where every five years we go on a honeymoon, okay? Because it's like life is crazy, it's hard. We can't celebrate our anniversary every year, so we save up our money, and on the fifth year, we always do something big and something fun. Well, our 10th anniversary, we were wiped out because we had three small kids, and all we wanted to do was go someplace where we could eat and sleep probably sleep more than we eat, but it was, it, was, it was great. So we found this resort in the Bahamas. It was awesome. Somehow, I'm a cheap guy. Somehow I ordered a room that had a butler, which was super weird. Uh, it took a while to get used to, but it was by the third day, I kind of got used to it because I'm sitting there by the pool. My butler walks up to me, brings me a plate of nachos and a couple of drinks that I didn't even ask for. And I'm like, yeah. I mean, all I need is somebody with a fern over me now, you know, and feeding me grapes, you know, and just kind of like... And so I'm sitting there by the pool. My kids aren't running up to me to ask me any questions. Uh, You know, I don't have to answer any emails. Nobody has to do the dishes. And I just, you know, I'm eating my nachos and enjoying my drink. And I look at my wife and I say, babe, this is the life. You ever said that to somebody before? This is the life. And what am I saying? I'm not saying like this is the biological existence, right? What am I saying? I'm saying this is the way life should be, right? Right? Now, some of you are like, oh, no, the beach is terrible. You got to go to the mountains. That's the life. I'm like, no, that's terrible. You got to jump out of an airplane. That's a life. No, man, you got to get in a garage and get all greasy and you got to work on cars. And no, that's the life. Who gets to decide what the life is, right? That's what's interesting here to me. Abundant life is not something I get to choose, that's not something I get to decide. It's something that Jesus has already prepared for me. He's made made it available to me. That's why he uses a shepherding metaphor here, okay? Because as sheep, we're never going to just accidentally wander into abundant life. We're never going to forage around and find it for ourselves. We have, if we have a good shepherd, he will lead us into a place where we experience that abundant life. Okay? It doesn't really matter where we are. If we are with our shepherd, we know that we'll flourish. That's why everyone loves Psalm 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Why do we love the passage so much? Because life is hard, and I'm not very good at it, and neither are you. We're all just trying to figure it out and we don't really know. We kind of bumble and fumble over our lives and we want to do it well, but we don't know if we're doing it right or not. And I really just want someone to show me how to do it well. 
And whether I'm in a green pasture or walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I have no fear, not because I have stuff, but because my shepherd is with me and his rod and his staff, they comfort me. That's abundant life, friends. Flourishing in life's up, ups and flourishing in life's downs. Experiencing a parched desert like it's green pasture, not because you have stuff, but because you are abiding and following and trusting in a good shepherd who leads you there. And when we're under his care, not only does he take care of us, not only does he lead us towards flourishing, he also protects us from what will destroy us. Because the tricky thing about listening to people who talk at you a lot about how you should live your life is that it may look good, it may sound good to you in the moment, but it can be costly and painful when we find out later on that those people really aren't interested in our flourishing. They said those things to us so that they could flourish, whether that's more money or more power or more fame for them. When we abide with our shepherd, he helps us recognize what a wolf in sheep's clothing look like, looks like because he's always pointing us to the truth and we're able to recognize a counterfeit when we see one. He also shows us how to stand up to people who are like that and how to run away from them if necessary, which is exactly what he does at the end of chapter 10. And if I can just say for a moment, even though it's not explicitly here in the text, I also want to say that not only does Jesus protect us from the outward threats that we might experience as sheep, he also protects us from the inward ones that we struggle with. I know you guys all walk in here with things on your shoulders. Some of you guys have lies that you just can't stop believing. You know they're not true, but you still believe them anyway. Some of you are stuck in addiction. You've tried and tried and tried and tried. And you can't kick it. Some of you are full of pride. Some of you are dealing with a lot of shame that's associated with your sin. But the reality is, is that Jesus has done more than enough to prove to you that he is the only one who has the authority to speak to you about who you are and what your struggle means about you. He has more authority than you do. His word is more important about you than what you think about yourself. He's the good shepherd. He lays down his life for you so that you can flourish. You see, that's how Jesus flips the metaphor on his head, right? Because what's a shepherd supposed to do? Care for and tend the flock so that you can bring it to slaughter but that's not what happens. He cares for and tends his flock and then he lays his life down and he becomes a sacrifice so that we can experience abundant life. He dies in our place. And if you abide with that kind of good shepherd, you will have access to abundant life that he has made available to you no matter what your circumstances may be. That's John's argument. That's what John feels is so compelling for us to see and to understand that we should make Jesus the good shepherd of our lives. But just in case there was a shred of any doubt, just in case you aren't quite convinced yet, John puts forth one more sign, one more reason, one more miracle, one more proof that Jesus is the authority on life itself and why we should listen to him. And that's here in John chapter 11. John 11 happens just about a month or two after John chapters 9 and 10, and it tells the story of Lazarus. Lazarus is the brother of Mary and Martha, and how he suddenly falls ill. His sisters, who are good friends with Jesus, they send for him because they believe he can come and heal him and make him well. But while they're waiting for Jesus to come, Lazarus dies. Jesus doesn't arrive until four days later. And Martha is really upset, really disappointed that Jesus didn't get there sooner. Look what she says here in chapter 11, verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Martha 
But even now, I, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know. I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I, I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. I think it's clear that Martha considers Jesus to be her good shepherd. That's without a doubt. But did you notice how she was frustrated and deeply disappointed in Jesus not acting the way that she expected or hoped? And yet she still does not lose faith in him? Jesus didn't do what she expected or wanted, but she kept her faith in him anyway. She trusted in his goodness despite her circumstances and despite her fears and despite what she felt. And did you notice how a good shepherd responds to Martha in that moment? He doesn't criticize her. He doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't shame her. He gives her hope. He gives her a promise. And that's what chapter 11 is all about. Jesus gives us promise of eternal life. And that's the second reason why we should listen to Jesus. Not only does he give us access to abundant life, Jesus gives us the promise of eternal life. You see, Martha knew her Old Testament. She would read her Bible. She knew the passages in Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel that promised a resurrection of the dead in the latter days. She knew that. But Jesus looks at her and says, that's not some far off distant event that you think is never going to happen. That is now. That promise is a person and that person is standing right in front of you and that eternal life isn't just for the life to come. It starts here and now with me. You see, Jesus offers us the chance to live even though we will die. He gives us a chance to live now and in the life to come. Friends, death comes to us all. It's our greatest enemy, and it not only awaits us, but it awaits each person that we love and we cherish. We spend a lot of time, we spend a lot of money, a lot of effort avoiding and trying to ignore death because it's one of the very few things in this world that we know we cannot control and we cannot predict. It's one of the greatest questions and fears that we have. What happens when we die. Jesus speaks with authority about this, and we should listen to him, because he is not only the one who makes our life abundant, he is also the one who sustains it all together. Jesus came not just to give us abundant life, but to give us that quality of life without the threat and without the insecurity of death. And though he speaks with authority and confidence, the really interesting thing here in John chapter 11 is that he makes it a matter of belief for Martha, right? There's no question here whether or not Jesus can deliver on what he says. The question is whether or not Martha will believe him. That's the question. And even though Martha says that she believes in him right away, you read the story a little bit further, it's pretty clear. Like, Jesus, don't open that grave, man. The, the, the body's going to smell. Like, she's not quite there yet. So Jesus, like I said before, is always going to back up his word with his works, right? He's never just going to make a blanket statement and then not prove it to be true. So he says that he's the resurrection and the life. He's going to prove it. And that's what he does here in verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb of Lazarus. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor. He's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? 
So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. You see, friends, Jesus commands what we cannot control. Jesus commands what we cannot control. Jesus just has to speak to Lazarus. Even though he's been dead for four days, just speaking to a dead man causes him to come to life, proving emphatically that Jesus is who he says that he is, that he is the resurrection on the life, not just metaphorically, literally. And what he did for Lazarus, he has promised to do for anyone who chooses to believe in him. You see, Lazarus is a representation of all of us. Resurrection to new life is not just something that's going to happen when we die physically. Because we all start out our physical lives spiritually dead. We start out our physical lives, even though we are biologically alive, we are spiritually dead. But the weird thing is, spiritual death doesn't feel like death. It actually feels like being very much alive, right? It actually feels the opposite of death because spiritual death is feeling like you know more than God. That you can speak with authority on how life should be lived, what is right and what is wrong, and you are the decider of those things. Even though you didn't create life, even though you can't command dead things to come to life, you still speak with authority about how life should be lived. Spiritual death leaves us as know-it-alls about life and people who have no need for God. But what happens when we go through life? We stink at it, right? We make mistakes. We find out pretty quickly that we're not as smart as we think we are. We think we can't handle the pressure that we thought. We can't control what happens to us or to those we love. We can't feel liked enough. We can't feel loved enough. We don't know how to measure up. And in the end, we feel like we're running on this never-ending performance treadmill that no one would ever describe as abundant life. That's because it's called spiritual death. That's life apart from God where you have no need for him. And Jesus, in his kindness, does not leave us there. He comes and stands outside the tomb and says, come out. And all we need to do is believe that he is the author of life, that he is the good shepherd who came to die for our sins, who knows how to live our lives better than we do, and we can walk out of that tomb spiritually alive to an abundant life that he has made available to us. That's John's goal in writing this gospel and that's where he brings all of these stories to an end here in chapter 12, really kind of the end of the first half of his gospel. He wants us to believe Jesus and enjoy life the way it was meant to be lived. The final call here in chapter 12 is for us to believe Jesus and enjoy life the way it was meant to be lived. And he's going to do that with a series of episodes here in this chapter that show us this ever-widening gap between those who believe in Jesus and those who reject him. And those contrasts are going to give us some very practical application points as we close our time together this morning. They'll give us three application points that I want you to see. Um, on what it means to believe in Jesus. How do I believe in Jesus? What does it look like if I am believing in Jesus? Number one happens in the first part of chapter 12, and that when you believe in Jesus, you treasure him over everything else. You treasure Jesus over everything else. And that story is perfectly illustrated here in the story of what Mary does for Jesus just a week before Passover. You see, Jesus comes back to Bethany, um, to the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and was invited over for dinner. I mean, how else are you going to thank a guy for bringing your brother back to, back to life from the grave? I mean, you can give him a gift card or give him a hug. Like, what? 
you want to come over for dinner? <laughs> so they have him over for dinner. And while they're, while they're eating during the meal, Mary gets up, takes a pound of very expensive perfume, probably the most expensive possession that she owned. And she begins to pour it over Jesus' feet and wipe her feet, wipe his feet with her hair. Judas, who is there witnessing this, on the other hand, again, a contrast, he's the treasure of the disciples and the one who is about to betray Jesus. He's repulsed by her, disgusted by her actions, thinking that this money should have been given to the poor. And the contrast could not be more sharp. Because belief in Jesus begins by treasuring who he is. If you don't believe in Jesus then he's just going to be the butt of your jokes and a word that you use when you want to curse. He's of no value to you. He's worthless. He's a word that you just throw away. But if you believe in him, if you believe that he's the one that raises us from the dead, the one who takes away our sin and our shame, he's our good shepherd, the one who makes abundant life possible, you treasure him above every other earthly possession that you have. And we treasure Jesus the same way we treasure people, with our time and with our sacrifice. Our time is our most important commodity that we have, and we only give it to people that we deem worthy of it. We give it to people that are the most important to us. And our sacrifice is directly connected to our time, because the more valuable a person is to us, the more we're willing to lay our lives down, our wants down, our dreams down for the good of the other person. When you believe in Jesus, you give him your time and you lay your life down because you treasure him. That's what it means to believe. Another indication that you believe in Jesus is not just that you treasure him over everything else, but that you identify yourself with him. In the middle of chapter 12 are a series of just brief episodes where you see a contrast between these people who want to honor and worship Jesus for who he is and these Pharisees and religious leaders who are finalizing their plot to have Jesus killed. That's another sharp contrast, a good test in this situation of how much you believe something is how much you're willing to be identified by that belief. I mean, it's just a silly example. Let's say you really believe in recycling, right? You are going to be a person that walks around and goes, you got to throw that in the wrong trash. You put that in the wrong trash, you can't put it in this one. We gotta save the planet. We gotta do all these things, which is great. Not only do you want people to recycle, but you also want people to know that you are one of them. I am one of those people who believes that recycling is important. I identify myself with that particular belief, right? It's hard to hide. When we believe in Jesus, we do the same thing. First, you identify him as your savior. If you, if you come to a place where you believe that you need a good shepherd in your life, you say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my savior. Come into my life. And then once you do that, you want to make a public profession of faith. And so you get baptized and you stand before everybody and you say, Jesus is now the Lord of my life. And then for the rest of your Christian walk, you're continuing to live out your life in such a way that demonstrates with your words and with your works that Jesus is the Lord of your life so that other people can come to know him as well. The conclusion of chapter 12 is a great summary, not just of the sermon we're talking about this morning, but really of all the first 12 chapters of John. Look at what Jesus says here at the end, and we'll close with this. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, Believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. So the last litmus test for us on what it means to believe in Jesus and how we know that we're believing in Jesus is that we keep his word. Is that we keep his word. When you take into account everything that Jesus has said about himself, that he is the Messiah, that he is the good shepherd, that he is the resurrection and the life, and then you pair it with everything that he has done to prove that he is who he says that he is, healing a man of blindness, raising Lazarus from the dead, If you believe that he is who he claims to be, then your daily 
and constant way of proving your word that you believe in Jesus is with your works too. If you say you believe in Jesus, then that should manifest in the way that you live your life, the way that you keep the word that he's given you. If he says he's the authority on life, then don't argue with him, just do it. No matter how you feel, no matter how bleak your circumstances may be, no matter how tempting the situation, no matter how hard the road, we are the ones who keep his word. That's who we are as followers of Jesus. We trust that he is the author of life, that no one else knows better how to live life than him. In fact, Jesus knows better how to live my life. He knows better how to do it than I do. That's why we choose to live our lives his way instead of our way. And one of the things that Jesus has commanded us to do is to observe the Lord's Supper together. That we gather together as a church and we are commanded to remember. Because when we remember Jesus and what he's done for us, we remember the significance of who he is and it helps us understand who we are and how we ought to live in this world. So on the things that I've just presented to you, that Jesus is the authority on life because he is the one that gives us access to abundant life and gives us the promise of eternal life, we come now to the Lord's table as those who believe that he is our good shepherd. As those people in this room who have come admitting that there are times we have not followed him as our good shepherd and we have some sins that we need to confess but we also know that he died on a cross and rose from the grave to wash us clean from those sins, which is also what we want to remember this morning. Okay, so if Noah will come on out, what we're going to do is we're going to take the Lord's table together. He's going to play a song and give you guys a few moments to reflect on what we've talked about this morning, to confess your sins, to prepare your heart to take communion, then I'll come back up here in a moment and we'll close and take the elements together.
On the night Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples together and he offered them the bread. He said, take this and eat, for this is my body given for you. Let's take together. Then after giving them the bread, he took the cup. He offered it to them and he said, take this and drink. For this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we come to you humbly, gratefully, because you have not left us here to life all alone, that you have come to be our good shepherd, that you make life abundant, and that you have given us the promise of eternal life. I pray, Father, that we would live and experience that now as we live out our belief in you here, as we leave this place, as we trust you, as we keep your word. Father, we're grateful for our church and we're grateful for a chance to be gathered together as your people this morning to observe your table and to remember who you are for us. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Church, if you'll stand, I'd love to give you a benediction before we go. If you still feel the burden and weight of sin on your shoulders and you would like to talk with someone about finding Jesus as a good shepherd for your life and asking him to be your savior, I'll be down front. would love to talk with you. I'm sure several of the other pastors would as well. And if you are one who is a follower of Christ, make sure somebody else knows it this week in your words and in your works. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace.